Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in our call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. in God's grace, let us join in our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends in Christ, hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. 
Thanks be to God. and join me in our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. As the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, may we hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A gale arose on the lake so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And our second scripture reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Shut up! Silence! And the wind ceased and there was a deep calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. For those who are unaware, Pastor John has been preaching through the Bible in a sermon series. And shortly after Pentecost here, we found ourselves in the Gospels. Knowing that I was going to preach this morning and next week, I looked to see where he would be in his planned scriptures. Yes, we do plan ahead to plan what passages I would focus on. And in this case, I saw that John would be somewhere between Matthew and Mark. So I decided to take my lead from our spiritual growth group, whose studies happened to line up well with John's plans of Matthew and Mark. In this case, spiritual growth was working its way through a study by a New Testament scholar, Amy Jill Levine, focusing on the miracles of Jesus. The first passage I chose that AJ, as she invites her readers to call her, focused on our passages for today. AJ focuses on the Mark version of the story, but also makes some comparisons to the Matthew and Luke passages that also share this story. She points out that in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew is focused on proving to people that Jesus is the Son of God. Matthew often quotes the Hebrew scripture directly. Mark, on the other hand, seems unlikely to be written to convince people of who Jesus is, but rather to help readers already part of the community of followers to better understand Jesus, at least as Mark knows Jesus. Now Mark assumes that the readers know some of the Hebrew scriptures and rather than direct 
directly quoting the, te the texts merely alludes to them. See, Mark alludes to Psalm 65 and Jonah and Noah in the story we're reading today. You see, the psalmist tells us that God silences the roaring of the seas and their waves. Jesus does that in this passage. Thus, the reader gets a hint of Jesus' identity as divine, even if the disciples don't quite get it. Now, the story here in Mark alludes to Jonah, who is a prophet type, who is asleep in the ship in the midst of a storm. And Noah, the words used in the Greek would have reminded early readers of the ark, and that arks are places of sanctuary where some live while others die. And so it's not hard, and it's actually hard not to think about water and boats this week. We've seen the news of five lives lost on a submersible and of the over 600 lives of refugees lost in the Mediterranean. Both instances resulted in the tragic and unnecessary loss of life. You see, boats are adventure and danger wrapped into one, and sometimes they're a sign of hope and respite from a difficult situation. But Mark isn't simply telling us about the boat. He's telling us about Jesus. So there's a reason that this story is included in Matthew and Mark and Luke. There's something about Jesus in this miracle that we need to know. So let's focus on Mark for the simplicity of our time together this morning. Who is Jesus? We know that prior to the scene in chapter 4, Jesus had been teaching parables about the kingdom of God. There were so many people that Jesus got into a boat to move into a better position to teach them. Mark tells us that te Jesus teaches about sowing seeds of the kingdom. A kingdom that will grow and spread rapidly in good soil, like that of a mustard seed. And so when Jesus is done, Jesus suggests to the disciples that they head to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The disciples take Jesus with them in the boat, just as he was. Well, what does that mean? A.J suggests that the phrase reminds people how very human Jesus was. Jesus falls asleep on a cushion in the stern of the boat. Jesus was tired. Jesus gets tired like we do. <laughs> and so the boat with Jesus and the disciples and other boats too are out on the sea. But then this storm quickly comes up and begins swamping the boat and presumably the boats around them too. Now Levine points out that four of the disciples are experienced fishermen who Jesus called to follow him directly off of the Sea of Galilee. And the sea that was now rising up all around them is the sea that they have worked. I have to wonder who it was that woke Jesus up. Was it one of the eight who weren't familiar with seafaring? Or was it one of the four who was experienced enough and recognized that this storm was too big even for them? They wake Jesus, a builder, a carpenter. Teacher, do you not care that we are going to die? Now, I don't know how many of you have been woken up to someone else's emergency in the midst of a very needed nap. But... There have been several occasions where Miguel has woken me up in the middle of the night, and I have had a very hard time coming up with kinder words in those very tired moments. Peace be still. It's too kind of a translation, perhaps. Jesus wakes up and scolds the wind, and in A.J. Levine's translation, which I shared some of this morning, says to the sea, silence, shut up. And there is a deep calm. Most translations say dead calm, but that's not quite it. It didn't die, but new calm. It was a deep calm. I like AJ's translation. It reminds us once again that Jesus is fully human, but it also reminds us that Jesus is fully divine. 
Jesus is present with us in the boat, and Jesus is tired. But Jesus is also fully capable of waking up and telling a whole sea and the wind to stop, shut up, and it does it. Now the disciples may not be catching all of these revelations as the readers are meant to. You know, Mark is, after all, crafting a story to explain who Jesus is to those already in the fold. But there is something here. There is something that happens, and the disciples know it. They say, who is this man? But Jesus asks those disciples who have experienced so much already with Jesus, have you still no faith? Now I imagine that Jesus is still a bit sleepily annoyed that he was woken up. I mean, he's been preaching all day. He's tired. Do you still not get it? We know from the rest of Mark that the disciples are pretty dense and have a difficult time of grasping who Jesus is. Indeed, who is this is their question. Now the disciples experience this all together collectively and wonder at who Jesus might be. They know that Jesus is fully human, fully divine, eventually, perhaps. Mark is trying to tell us that. You see, they are not alone in this experience of the extreme wind and wave being suddenly deeply quiet. Early on in the story, in verse 36, we are told that there are other boats out at sea. I wonder what it was like in those other boats that did not have Jesus with them in the storm. Did the other boats also have experienced fishing persons on board? Surely while some of them were traveling alongside Jesus' boat as people who had just heard Jesus' teaching, there were also several who may have just happened to be in the water at the same time whether going across to the same harbor that Jesus and the disciples were heading to, or perhaps they were heading to the place Jesus and his disciples had just left. What were those boats like? Were they good quality? Were they a little rickety? Jesus' boat had at least 13 people on it, so it couldn't have been too tiny. Maybe it was James and John's dad's Zebedee's boat. Maybe, maybe he happened to be there for an opportunity to see his, his boys, and, and Jesus said, here, let me get on. And you know, Whose boat was it? Was it a sturdy boat? And what about the other boats floating around? They were all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Were their boats damaged during the high winds and strong waves? Was anyone washed overboard? This potentially traumatic moment was stilled for the disciples and they saw and heard Jesus tell the sea and the wind to be silent. But what about those people who didn't have the same God-given resource before their eyes? One of the commentaries I read this week talked about how the church building is often referred to in terms that are used on a boat. We have the nave, a nautical term that is used to describe right where many of you are sitting this morning. And recently, the world experienced a storm of its own. COVID-19 literally shut down much of the world and left us unable to safely join together, fearing severe illness, and we all lost a very large number of people to this illness. In fact, I was only employed here for 17 days before we made the call to close down and record worship. I was supposed to meet the youth and their parents on the 22nd of March in 2020, and it never happened. We had a few good online meetings, but everyone was so tired of video and meetings with school and work being online that It made it difficult to keep anybody's interest and energies up. Our boat where we gather each Sunday and throughout the week was no longer safe to gather. Some of us were fortunate and were able to visit with friends and family through video calls and of course our old standby, the telephone. Many tuned in regularly to our video recordings and eventually live stream. 
But some were in a different boat. Some were unable to do that. Some only had a TV at home to connect. Some then have lost the community to the church, lost connection to the church community. So how have we as a church community sought to cut, sought out those who were cut off? You know, the pandemic was terrible for those of us with mental health conditions, particularly those that thrive when the people are feeling the most lonely. Depression and anxiety make for a difficult boat ride through the storm of COVID. It makes it difficult to pick up the phone to call somebody. It makes it difficult to join in on the live stream or video recording. How have we as the church sought to reach out to those who felt most alone and afraid? You know, the pandemic is still ongoing, frankly, and for those of us who have autoimmune conditions, catching COVID could be life-threatening. How do we as the church continue to care for those among us while the world goes back to normal? Maybe you were one of those boats floating in the storm without the resources that you know, the disciples readily had. Maybe you even had all the resources and still felt just as afraid as the disciple who called out to Jesus, do you not care that we are going to die? Now it is comforting to know that we are not alone, that others were in the boat with us and that there were other boats in the midst of the storm. But it should also give us pause as we consider that some in our boat have the skills to navigate the rough waters. Some of us have the faith and trust that God will calm the waters, and some don't. Some in the very boat that we're in. And that some of those other boats in the storm who weren't as fortunate didn't make it out safely. And so Jesus invites us to love God and to love our neighbor. So I would invite us today to start there. Think of those who during COVID you haven't seen in our, in our sanctuary. Think of those who you haven't seen around in your regularly visited spaces. Maybe we start there in caring for those around us. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, amen.
This morning, as we turn to God in prayer, we remember a couple of my family members. My brother Bobby, who is uh, 66, he fell um, and broke his hip. Um, they are they have repaired his hip temporarily, but it's going to lead to a lot more complications down the road. And so. Uh, keeping Bobby and Selena in your prayers, Selena being his wife, um, I would be grateful. Uh, praying also for my mom, who uh, has improvement in some of her health concerns, um, but will need additional surgery as well. Um, I would appreciate and covet your prayers for her. Our church members this morning, we pray for Kurt. It is good to see you here this morning. Um, we also pray for uh, folks like Peggy Lambden, as well as Jane Denny and family on the death of her husband, Sid, Pat Potter, Norm, and the family and friends of Angel Lifem. We pray for many others, including our travelers and those experiencing gun violence, especially in the US, and those in war situations around the world. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we come before you with our prayers on behalf of the world. We pray for the church universal, for those boats that are out at sea, doing ministry and working. We pray for their ministry and for those who minister that the world might believe in you, creator of the universe. We pray for the world, for those in distress, distress or those with special needs, and all of those in authority, that peace and justice might prevail. We hold before you the nation, the state, local communities, and those who govern in them, that they may know and have strength to do what is right, that they may have wisdom and kindness at the forefront of their minds. We pray for our local community, for our church and the churches in our area as we face special issues and needs. We pray for those who are struggling with their faith, that they be given assurance of your goodness and your mercy. We ask that you comfort, comfort those in the midst of transitions in life, that they be guided and supported. For those who are facing critical decisions, we ask that they might receive your wisdom and guidance. O oh, divine healer, we pray for those who are sick, grieving, lonely, and anxious. Might we and they be comforted and healed. And we pray for all members of your holy family. By your grace, may we be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we might be your hands and feet on earth fulfilling the purpose and plans you have set before us. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Freely we have received, freely let us also give, as we present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord.
Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, from whom comes all good, and every perfect gift we bring a portion of the time, talents, and treasure that you have entrusted to us. Bless these gifts so that the church may prosper and humanity may be served through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So he, let's join in our charge and benediction, friends. Let us go in peace to love and serve God and our neighbors. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us. Amen.